seminars. Uh, I'm pleased to uh, introduce uh, our speakers. Let me please remind you first that uh, we are going to record this. So if you don't want to appear in video, uh, that's a good time to switch off your, your camera. Okay, so the first speaker, uh, actually both speakers were previously postdocs here at CFA. Uh, so we are playing home today. Uh, so the first speaker uh, is uh, Barbara Ercolano from uh, Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, Germany. So she earned her PhD at uh, uh, University College in London in UK, and then she was uh, there in postdoc. Then she moved at CFA as a postdoc. And uh, uh, there she developed the first version of the 3D photo ionization and dust uh, radiation transfer code called uh, Mocassin to study gaseous nebulae uh, typical of, of uh, star forming regional environments. And for the development of this code, she also received the, the Fowler Award for early career achievement in astronomy from the Royal Astronomical Society. Um, at the CFA, she extended the Mocassin code to the X-ray uh, regime and became the uh, first very interested in planet formation and protoplanetary disk evolution. So today she's talking to us about the importance of X-rays in the evolution of protoplanetary disks. Uh, thank you, Barbara, for being with us. The floor is yours. Thank you for the nice introduction. I'd forgotten all that myself, so <laughs> nice to be reminded. What I do remember indeed is that the, uh, the time at the CFA was very important for me for the development of my uh, scientific um, interests. And in fact, a lot of the work that I present today still stems from the work that uh, we did at the time together with uh, John Raymond and uh, Jeremy Drake um, with whom are still collaborating um, today. And so I um, recently gave the Harvard Colloquium and I talked a lot about um, disk evolution um, and observational um, probes of uh, disks and winds and how it works with planet formation. So I will not repeat much of that today also because I have much less time, but we'll basically focus here on, the, um, on why we really believe that indeed uh, the X-ray properties of uh, young stars are what are determining finally the fate of the um, of the protoplanetary disk, and so finally also on the of the planets that are able to form and to evolve into these disks. And so um, this is a, a slide. If you were at the colloquium, already saw, uh, but I wanted to show it again because it really sets the scene of what's happening here. So the disk is sitting there, um, trying to make planets. While it tries to do that, it's also being irradiated by something that is about ten thousand times more active than our sun, which is pictured here, uh, and is emitting basically a thousandth of its polarimetric luminosity into the X-rays. Now, these X-rays are interesting because um, obviously the large penetration depth that they have, the disks are very thick. Um, so you have very large columns and very little can penetrate to the, to the, to the very inner core of these disks. But X-rays do, or certain wavelengths of the X-rays do. And the hard X-rays are important because they can drive chemistry and also provide ionization deep into the disk. Um, which is basically charges what you need uh, so that the disk knows <laughs> uh, that there is uh, a magnetic field. And so the coupling to the magnetic field is all basically um, depending on the charge uh, that, is, um, that is acquired into the disk. Soft X-rays are also interesting because they heat the disk in the surface. Um, but going back to magnetic uh, to magnetic fields, as always, well, very interesting to know basically which parts of the disk are coupled, which are not coupled. Um, also because uh, of the problem of accretion within the disk itself, which nowadays is also believed um, to be at least partially driven by uh, MHD winds. So today I will not be talking about these MHD winds, which basically extract angular momentum from the disk, but I will be talking about the um, thermal winds, so what we call photoaperative winds, which is basically due to the fact that heating in the um, surface of the disk uh, brings some of the material to overcome the gravitational potential and basically be unbound and then centrifugally accelerated into, the, into a wind. Now, these winds are very different from MHD type of winds because they don't carry out any angular momentum, so do not play a part in driving accretion through the disk. But 
actually destroy the disc completely. <laughs> so they are just as important because they are basically um, dominating uh, the late stages of evolution of these discs by removing the material uh, from the inside out. Uh, the disc lifetimes are necessarily uh, the planet formation life lifetimes, and this is the giant planet formation lifetimes, because once you remove the disc, you basically don't have the gas anymore to make the giant planets, while you might still be uh, playing around with terrestrial bodies. And this is basically a few million years, and you can't really treat the planet formation problem without knowing how the dust, how, how basically the building blocks, how the material from which these planets are formed is evolving. This is why it's important to understand the interplay of the central star with its environment. This is what we try to also kind of picture here in a simplified map, which caused a lot of, um, let's say, um, discussion um, as to where exactly these various processes are happening in the disk. So this is taken from the PP7 chapter, which wrote in collaboration with uh, Jeff Wallace and many other authors. And this particular plot uh, was initiated by uh, Mario Flock, which shows a lot of basically of um, physical processes that dominate the disk kinematics, which are obviously important for the formation of planets. So uh, photooperative winds are up here in the upper um, atmosphere of the wind, uh, of the disk. And it doesn't, doesn't go to very large columns into the mid -day. And also, um, photooperative wind cannot happen very close to the star, where the gravitational pull is very strong, while MHD winds may happen there. And also not too far away from the star, where the heating then becomes too little. But again, MHD winds may happen there. So they have a sweet spot exactly in the planet forming region of the uh, of these disks. Should also note here that X-rays are also important to uh, the, these other processes. Uh, MRI obviously, uh, magnetic rotation instability very much depends on the uh, on the charge uh, that you can acquire into the into the disk, but also the MHD winds themselves being basically an ideal MHD phenomenon also depends on basically what type of resistivities are dominating where and how much material you'll be, you're able to basically charge onto the magnetic field lines. And so it's very important to understand basically this interaction of the central star to the, to, with, the, with the gas in the disk, even letting alone the photooperative uh, problem itself. But let's go back to the photooperative problem. So what do we actually no. Well, everybody works on this, and there's now a lot of people who have been <laughs> working on this in the recent years, in the last 10 years, um, agree on this broad brush, broad brush picture, which is basically that the, the disk is accreting, so the mass is moving in. In the classical picture, angular moment is moving out if you have some kind of viscosity. It doesn't matter if you believe in winds, angular moment is going up. <laughs> it doesn't matter. The main thing is that mass is moving in. Mass is moving in because angular momentum is being lost somewhere or redistributed. And so you have an accretion rate into the disk. So this is replenishing the central parts of the disk from the outer parts. You have the star that is irradiating the disk, warming it up, and some part of the electromagnetic field emitted by the star is heating up the disk and is producing basically these thermal outflows which are now a mass loss term. Now, where this mass loss term locally exceeds the accretion through the wind, through the disk, then you basically have a gap because basically the, the accretion rate is not able to replenish the material at the same rate at which the mass loss rate from the wind is taking it out. At this point, um, you basically decouple the outer and inner disk, the inner disk um, accretes onto the central star, and the outer disk is then left to basically uh, evolve from the inside out. And in fact, this inside out evolution and this removal of material is uh, very, very important for the final architecture of planetary systems. Um, this was work that um, Christina Munch also did uh, with us at the, um, at the USM for a PhD, and she's continuing in some way. But also this um, was, um, was mentioned in, uh, in the paper by Bebe Liu, a couple of um, a couple of days ago, Sharon Raymond was also on it. This was a nature paper in which they even um, 
showed, I think, convincingly that in fact this inside out removal of the of the material while the giant planets were still embedded in the disk is what basically caused the um, early uh, solar system instabilities that basically led to the solar system as we know it now. Now this uh, proper picture, as I say, from this dispersal is more or less shared by uh, all the authors uh, who have worked on the problem over the years. But how the disk is moving material is losing material and how much it would break. This is basically anybody's guess at this moment. At least you would think so if you look at uh, how different our predictions are. So you see, these are basically uh, normalized mass loss rates. Um, so say this is, let's say, a sigma dot. So how much material is being lost at each radius of the of the disk? But these curves here are normalized. So the, the total mass loss rates actually differ between the different models, sometimes by two, two orders of magnitude. So we definitely don't agree uh, on the actual modality in which the disk is dispersing. And exactly that is what enters the planet formation models or so the models as the ones that I showed before I mentioned before um, of um, planetary architecture. So you actually need to know where the disk is producing the gap and how the how fast the, the, the removal is happening before you can make any predictions on planet formation. So the whole point of understanding photo operation is to enter the era of quantitative planet formation models and we're still missing agreement on this. And so the way that we uh, did it, let's say from the X-ray, <laughs> X-ray photo operation um, community, let's say we um, had um, several versions of our um, of our, our photo operation models by doing hyd radiation hydrodynamic uh, calculation, in which basically we used a hydro code. At the moment, we use Pluto. We used to use Flash some time ago, as a long time a long time ago. Um, and we update the temperature at each hydrodynamical steps using detailed radiative transfer calculation, which we did with the Moccasin code, which has been mentioned at the, in, the, in the introduction. So in fact, the version of the Moccasin code that was developed here at the CFA. Um, this basically gives us a, a way of absolutely no computational costs to, um, to relate the temperature to the uh, local ionization parameter, uh, X-ray. Uh, and the column density at each point. So this is, very, is a very cheap uh, method and has allowed us to basically build uh, a, now a library of hydrodynamic uh, simulations, which is basically over 300, which is the largest library of this type of simulation that you have. And we have basically what we get after this, this disquint this profiles, which is the main ingredient that is needed for the planet population synthesis codes. And so this is the way that we relate to uh, reality because we can then compare with exoplanet surveys, we can compare with um, basically planet demographics, disk demographics, but also we have made some more specific uh, comparison with uh, observations of, for example, line profiles from these disks or from the winds particular and of dust emission. And so we were pretty happy with our results that there were, there were no um, major problems that we identified through these comparisons. And so we were confident that basically using our models, you could uh, make reasonable uh, assumptions as to the, basically the boundary conditions to planet formation. However, um, the recently a new work has appeared in which um, the, the step of updating the temperature, let's say the week decoupled from the hydrodynamics um, was done self-consistently. So this uh, is a very nice work by Langin um, um, Goodman. It's also worked by Makatani in which they used um, the Athena code uh, and were able to solve the thermochemistry basically on the fly with the hydrodynamics. And so in some way you, you would think this is a more um, suitable approach because it releases the assumption of um, thermal balance, which we have to make if we use a code like Moccasin to calculate the temperatures beforehand and then map it onto a hydro. However, we were very, very puzzled by the huge differences and the, the, the complete basically change of paradigm um, of how photo operation would happen. So this is basically 
uh, showing the difference in the uh, thermal structure of the winds, which were calculated using the Athena code and an old calculation of James Owen and myself using uh, the Zeus code, um, which is basically similar to what we're doing right now um, using, the, um, using the Pluto code. So what you see is basically a wind that is colder, close to the star, and reaches temperature of 10 to the 5, so 100,000 Kelvin, uh, at the disk surface. So we couldn't explain this at all, since um, in our picture you have basically a hot wind which maximums about 10,000 Kelvin, where the EUV can penetrate. And as you move to the X-ray dominated part, which is most of the, most of the wind, um, you have cooler temperatures, as you would expect. And so we basically were puzzled and also worried, basically, uh, <laughs> a huge um, 300 and uh, over uh, hydro simulation also or conclusions that we had and then so nicely matched the exoplanet surveys and all the things that we could so, um, so nicely explain could actually be completely wrong. We thought, oh, maybe this, this, the, the thing that's different here is um, please compare uh, just the, the two, the last two columns here. The things that are different here is that we are not doing any chemistry and FUV heating or adiabatic cooling calculation on the fly. And this, we are missing uh, elements here, ingredients, which these calculations have. And so we must be missing something. This must be important. And so we um, decided to delve deeper into this problem to, um, to see um, how we could solve it or whether this was True, and we realized that, of course, um, doing the thermochemistry on the fly, as was done in these calculations, required um, to cut, um, cut some corners. And the corners, of course, needed to be cut, particularly in the rigidity transfer part. So for us to have a reasonable um, description of the radiation field that gives us a reasonable description of the temperature within uh, the rigidity transfer calculation, we can get away <laughs> with less than basically a thousand frequency points because we have to catch all the you know all, all, all the cross sections and all the thresholds and we have to make sure that we get our points at the threshold to these thresholds are very steep as you as you know and so it's very difficult to do this with uh, with a few points um, in these calculations the, the only the maximum that they could allow themselves and Clear, you know, this is a very, very time consuming and, and conditionally consuming calculation. The maximum that's here was used was seven. So this is seven to a thousand. And so the sevens that you have, you better place them <laughs> where you need them. And we realized that, it, particularly for the, uh, for the X ray part, the X ray band that was used in this calculation was at one kilo electron volt. So Mm, when you say, okay, the Wang and Goodman included the X-rays and they, they said, you know, they come to the conclusions that they don't do anything. Well, we say our, the reason for that is that these X-rays are simply too hard. In fact, already back in the days here at CFA, um, at the time we were worried about the fact that some of the X-ray spectrum from the central, X-ray emission from the central star could be absorbed out by accretion columns around the stars. This was the thing that, that well, at the time we didn't know that these accretion columns are actually broken up, and so most of the of the of the light comes out. Um, and so we basically played around with models in which we absorbed out a column, an even a, lar a, a larger and larger column of the um, of the of this uh, input spectrum of the star, and see and looked at what happens to the to the mass loss rates by doing that. And you see from this very old plot, this was done using hydrostatic equilibrium calculations. Was, this is nothing special, but just a very simple calculation shows that if you only left be basically KV um, photons, you, you don't get that much um, mass loss rate. And this is because these guys are not interacting very much in the in the low columns in this in the in the disk atmosphere which is where you need to unbound the material from and so it's no surprise that the um by having a an x-ray band one x-ray point at one kv you would come to the conclusion this is not very efficient at uh, driving a wind and you will come up with a very different type of wind and so we decided that we needed to really check this into detail. And um, Kathy Clark and her student, Andrew Selleck, um, took this to a different level, uh, did a lot of tests, 
Um, and this is a, a pretty technical paper that came out um, some, some weeks ago. And please uh, just concentrate right now on this magenta line. Don't try to understand anything else from these plots. Just look at where this magenta line is. What this magenta line is, is basically the location of the Bernoulli surface, which might say nothing to you about your life. This is just basically where the wind is coming from. This is the bottom of the wind, the wind, um, let's say, the wind base. And remember that the, the disk gets thicker and thicker, so denser and denser, the lower you go. And so if you compare these three plots here without knowing what they are, you basically see that the wind base, the Bernoulli surface, goes further and further down. So you can immediately imagine that um, this plot over here, so that at the right, I don't know if you can see my cursor, um, at, the right, at the very right hand plot has a higher mass loss rate than the left hand plot because it's unleashing material from where it's denser. So mass loss rate is more or less rho CS, so the density at the bottom of the wind and the sound speed. Sound speed is more or less the same. It's anyway the root of the temperature, so it doesn't really matter. Um, what's really changing here by orders of magnitude is the density that of the material that is being unbound. And so this guy is much more efficient than this guy. And what's changed from here to here to here is basically just the spectrum, the irradiated spectrum. Here you have a spectrum that basically just has EUV radiation, so 13.6 EV more or less. Here you have a spectrum that has just 500 EV radiation, so already it's much more efficient. And here you have a realistic spectrum, so we call it a realistic spectrum, the spectrum that we used in all our calculations, um, which should be more appropriate for, an, um, for, a, for a young star. And so you see that basically the, the star is determining very much um, how much uh, wind you're able to, to produce. Now, if you're curious about the, the reason why the temperature in the wind was very different, well, we investigated that as well. Um, and we came to the conclusion that, in fact, the molecular and adiabatic cooling that is missing in our calculations is definitely not the problem. In fact, this would go the, the opposite way, you know, would make our wind even more, even cooler, so even more different from the, um, the let's say, the self-consistent thermochemistry calculation that I showed before. Indeed, this is not the problem. The problem is the fact that, again, um, if you're doing a self-consistent thermochemistry calculation, you also need to cut down on the number of uh, lines that you are calculating. Um, on the fly. And if you cut down on the wrong lines, then you end up uh, with not enough coolants. In fact, line cooling, we find that dominates completely uh, both uh, collision excited line, but particularly lime and alpha, uh, dominates completely over this molecular and adiabatic cooling that is missing from us. And it turns out that this is treated very differently in the other calculations. And this is where the discrepancies um, there come from. And so thanks to Andrew and thanks to Kathy, we came to, um, to understand these differences and um, were more than ever basically, um, let's say, supported into continuing in our um, production of um, what we believe are realistic photo operation models that are driven by uh, realistic X-ray spectra from young stars. And so uh, we also were a little bit scared that the, <laughs> the X-ray spectrum would make such a huge difference. And so um, we actually went back and uh, looked at our spectra again, thanks to Jeremy and thanks to Thomas Prybish, who basically went uh, and looked at the emission measures that they found in the CUP, uh, in the Chandra Rival 3D project sample for the young stars uh, of different X-ray luminosities and produced spectra basically that were more, um, they, they were more um, appropriate for this type of emission measures. And so this is where we are at the moment. I think we have um, photo operation models that are mature enough to uh, be linked to planet formation models. In fact, we're doing this in several different projects that I haven't talked about today. And the only thing that I would like to for you to keep, take away from the talk today is that um, soft, so the soft part of the X-ray, so less than 1 keV for young stars, is indeed extremely efficient at driving um, the mass um, loss from disks. So it finally causes the demise of the disk 
And so the disk life, uh, lifetimes and the formation evolution of the planetary systems are definitely completely coupled to the X-ray properties of um, the central stars. And so that's all I wanted to say today. Okay, let's thank our speaker. Thanks, Barbara, for this wonderful talk. Uh, let's see, do we have any question from the audience in person first? Don't see any. There is a hand raised offer. Uh, you can speak up. Thank you, Barbara, for a nice talk. Um, I assume that all these models assume that the disk wind is propagating into more or less empty space. But in reality, there'll be a magnetized supersonic stellar wind there. How would the inclusion of the stellar wind may change the results? But this is a very good question. And indeed, I, I believe that this will uh, change the results in the sense that this wind is also ionized, it's charged. So it's, not, it's definitely going to care about this. So we haven't made the calculations, but it's, um, we are hoping to go right now into that, um, into that direction. We have a PhD student that's trying to do this together with uh, Oli Gressel in Berlin. Um, they are at the beginning of these calculations. The problem that we have there is, uh, of course, getting close enough in terms of resolution to the central star where this, where this effect would be, um, would be most, um, most, um, most uh, will be strongest. But uh, we hope to do that. Uh, I, in the end, I think that what this will do will increase the efficiency of the winds in the inner parts of, um, of the wind, so a closer stellar radii, which might also explain why some of the um, spectral uh, diagnostics that we see uh, show winds that are driven from closer in. Now, whether this is now still a thermal wind or whether this is done in MHD wind uh, is, <laughs> is probably a semantic problem. Uh, it, it will depend uh, on which, um, or whether it's the magnetic fields or the um, irradiation luminosity that is dominating the energetics of the wind. And this is something that we also tried to explore with Peter Rodenkirch work some years back, so a couple of years ago. Um, but again, it's very difficult to do because of resolution problem in inner parts of the grid. But we believe that there will be um, a certain critical value for the magnetic field strength to the uh, X-ray luminosity that will determine which part um which part which component dominates thank you barbara any other question from the zoom people don't see any uh maybe i can ask one so you showed uh, a very interesting list of the effects which can contribute to the this ionization. what about uh, yeah this one so since these are active stars what about uh, uh, just uh, uh, very energetic particles which are produced uh, at flares uh, at the star, or in case uh, CMEs can escape and uh, produce shocks, uh, particles which are accelerated there. So they can also some way contribute to the ionization, at least of the inner disk. Um, so this will be driven uh, likely by the uh, stellar magnetic field, as uh, over was talking about before. But the, the disk, uh, the, the magnetic field in the disk might also play a role there. So, um, would it be possible, for example, to include uh, the effect of the um, collisions of these energetic particles into the outer layers of the disk to see how they contribute? That's, a, that's an interesting this. question. And this is something that we thought about a lot. Um, particularly thinking about flares, also even forgetting about the energetic particles um, that are maybe too energetic to, to interact uh, in, the, um, in the upper parts. But still, like in, if you think of these mega flares that are basically um, producing a much harder spectrum and increasing the X-ray luminosity for a short time uh, by two orders of magnitude, so do they have an effect? So we get this question a lot and we would very much like to know the answer. In fact, uh, Jeremy also produced some spectra to, to make us play with that. The problem that our models might have in this, um, to, to do this properly is the fact that, as I mentioned before, these are basically um, equilibrium models. And so if the spectrum is changing faster than the, 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 the disk, 
um, can accommodate, let's say, so if this becomes out of equilibrium, then our calculations on uh, the way that we do the calculation using the um, temperature ionization parameter parameterization is then not correct anymore. And so we are exploring now these ways of uh, solving this problem by basically doing um, a, um, a self-consistent calculation, a self-consistent thermochemistry calculations to, um, to relax this equilibrium um, assumptions. In order to do that, we again will have to cut corners. <laughs> and so we will not produce anymore um, the, um, what we believe are, are, are these uh, realistic models. But um, we thought that we still do that exactly to explore uh, the effect that you mentioned in order to see whether it actually does have a, um, an effect. Um, the, a calculation that was done many years ago by um, Richard Nelson and uh, Martin Ilgner to look at uh, how the chemistry uh, responded to these mega flares, um, basically came to the conclusions that because these mega flares are so rare, in the end, it didn't, it didn't really make that much difference uh, because it was the quiescent uh, and extra luminosity that would basically dominate than uh, the chemical structure of the disk. But whether it would make a difference in creating um, blasts of mass loss within the disk, this is something that we haven't explored yet, but we definitely would like to do that. Perfect. Thank you so much. OK, let's thank, uh, uh, let's thank Barbara again. Okay, let's move to the second. Okay, um, so the second speaker is uh, Jun Yang from MIT. Uh, she's currently postdoctoral research at uh, the Kavli Institute. Uh, she's been there since 2019. So uh, she's first earned uh, her uh, bachelor in physics and applied physics in uh, Jiangsu, I hope I pronounced correct, in 2009. Then uh, PhD at the University of Massachusetts Lowell in uh, 2017. And then she spent uh, about one year, one year and a half at uh, the CFA before uh, uh, being at the uh, uh, University of Utah as postdoctoral fellow and currently, as I said, at uh, MIT. So she's talking to us today about X rays from neutron stars and black holes in the local group, N33 and the galactic bulge. Please take it away. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. So I will be talking about the X-rays uh, for neutron star and black holes in local group M33 and the galactic barge. Yeah, and that, okay. yeah, so the first part I will be talking about the uh, classification for the uh, black hole and the neutron stars in M33 with uh, new star observations. Then the second part, I will talk about the interstellar medium uh, with uh, Chandra, so look at the galactic barge. So as you already know, uh, neutron stars and uh, black holes, they are about 10 to 6 kilometers away, and uh, uh, the neutron star and the black hole with uh, disk about uh, 10 to 5 kilometers and the radius with uh, 10 kilometers. So this is our general luminosity and the temperature in X-rays. Uh, so when we look at the neutron stars and the black holes in nearby galaxies, we are also interested in what the interstellar medium are contribute to the data. So with these uh, gravitational wave sources, we can also trace uh, axion dark matter profile. So we use, uh, uh, for X-rays, we use a Chandra uh, x minute or new star to look at these sources. So first I will talk about the young black hole and the neutron star systems in the star forming galaxy M33 with the new star view. So this is a galaxy M33. And uh, why do we choose M33? Uh, because uh, this galaxy uh, has a low distance about 817 kiloparseconds. 
with relative new phase on orientation and active star forming. Uh, so made it the ideal target to, to study the extra galactic high-mass experiments. So also this uh, M33 uh, new star observations can help us to constrain the accretion states of the black holes and neutron stars. Yeah. So we uh, used uh, about uh, six, 100 kiloseconds new star observations. So this uh, shows uh, the So this shows uh, six observations and uh, each field with two observations. This shows the uh, details of each observation about 600 kiloseconds in total in our survey. Uh, the upper right is the uh, optic image for M33. Uh, this red outlines the field view of the new star observations. First, we searched the position in the bright source M33 X8. And uh, we found some periodicities in uh, this observation. This figure is a periodogram for M33 X8. And uh, the, this uh, period is 98 minutes is the orbital period of the new star satellite. On the left, the 12 minutes uh, are detected from two simultaneous detections of instrument A and B, but with uh, 0.7 minutes discrepancy. And so if they, uh, this, we confirm this source as arch luminous X3 person, then it will be the uh, UX pulsars with the slowest steam period about 700 seconds. We uh, use a modeling to extract the counter rate for each source we identified. So this shows an example as a M33X8. First, we use the SAO DSLI uh, to get the initial estimate about the count rate, about 0.1 counts per second. So this uh, on the left, it shows the uh, uh, smooth background subtracted uh, image and the middle is a model. And on the right is a residue between the model and the observation. So we get the final count rate is about 0.2 counts per second. And for this new star survey, we have uh, identified uh, 28 sources with uh, larger than three sigma significance. Uh, we uh, use a uh, uh, new star diagnostic diagram to classify the uh, x batteries. So this figure is a color intensity diagram. The x-axis hardness ratio is calculated in the counter rate in soft energy band 4 to 6 keV, intermedium 6 to 12 keV, and the hard energy band 12 to 25 keV. So these uh, uh, colored symbols are the galactic sources. The soft state black hole is plotted in pink, and the green and Blue is uh, intermediate and uh, soft state black holes, and the purple are the pulsars. The source, sources in M33 are uh, detected by new star, are plotted in the black dots. So we uh, found uh, there are six sources are pulsars, and about eight sources lie in the hard state black holes. Roughly 10 and four sources, uh, intermediate and uh, soft state black holes. So the brightest source is uh, M33X8 is an ultra luminous X3 source. And this is a color color diagram. The source distribution is consistent with a color intensity diagram. Then we compare this with the uh, sources in M33 uh, because these two galaxy have, galaxies have similar sensitivity but a different uh, uh, source population. So this is a low mass X-ray battery dominate, but uh, uh, M33 has more uh, mostly high mass X-ray batteries and uh, black hole dominates. Uh, 
uh, we then use the uh, uh, use star hard energy band to unique uh, get the unique hard band luminosity function. This figure is a cumulative luminosity function uh, shows the sources detected with uh, larger than one sigma significance in the hard energy band 12 to 25 keV. All these sources are detected with larger than three sigma significance in the broad energy band 4 to 25 keV. And this is a luminosity function of the AGN. So we can use this, uh, uh, so this red is a, a parallel model. So we can use this to study the demographics of the uh, MS extra barrier population the M33. Uh, for uh, this part, we uh, have found some uh, periodicities in the arch luminous X-ray source M M33 X8, and uh, we have identified 28 sources with larger than three sigma significance. Mm -hmm. And we classify the most of the sources are uh, intermediate and hard state black holes, and we confirmed six sources. Uh, we use uh, new star unique hard uh, luminosity functions to study the formation and the evolution of the high mass expiries in M33 uh, because of their dependence on the galaxy, such as stellar mass, star formation rate, and the local environment. So uh, now we get into the second part about the interstellar medium. So we look at the uh, galactic barge, we, we measure the silicon X-ray absorptions towards light, different lines of sight. Uh, so uh, because we this uh, dust contained in interstellar matter can tell us the composition and the evolution of the interstellar media, which dominates the cooling and the heating process, uh, can tell us uh, information about star formation rate. So we uh, use a gas and a dust contained with silicon uh, with the Chandra high energy transmission grating spectrometer to measure the silicon gas and the dust optical depths towards this light uh, bright low mass X batteries. And later we compare the optical depths with the molecular hydrogen in radio. Uh, this figure is, uh, shows the background is about the Wisconsin HR, HR alpha mapper survey. And uh, these are the sources uh, in our survey. So here uh, are the two extreme examples of the sources in our survey. Uh, this shows the high resolution structure of the silicon edges. Uh, we can only say this uh, high resolution structure when we look at the Chandra HETG data and the highest resolution. So they are well calibrated and pair up free. So on the right, it's uh, GX5 minus one. We can say this uh, silicon gas edge and the, this uh, dust edge. So uh, for this source, the dust is dominated and uh, only liter gas contributed to the edge structure. But for uh, GX3 plus one, both gas and the dust contribute to the edge structure. Uh, for all the sources in our survey, uh, we used the broadband continuum model to fit, to fit the spectrum. Then we added the silicon gas edge model and the silicon dust edge, as well as the ionized silicon. These figures shows all the uh, slide sources we have fit, fitted and we get the uh, gas and dust edges. And we use this to calculate the silicon gas and the dust optical depths. On the left, the figure shows uh, all the sources, uh, gas edge optical depths as a function of the dust edge optical depths. We can say uh, most of the sources, uh, their dust size are consistent with the uh, MRN standard dust size distribution. On the right, we plotted their uh, optical depths uh, as a function of the molecular uh, 
uh, hydrogen, a uh, border band hydrogen column density. And uh, the red is a uh, silicon gas optical depth, and the blue is a uh, dust optical depth. So we can say the uh, silicon gas optical depth uh, is uh, linearly correlating with uh, uh, hydrogen column density. Uh, but for the dust, uh, it's not. So this shows uh, the silicon gas uh, homogeneous, but the dust a lot. So this dashed blue curve can be expressed in this formula. Since the dust uh, optical depth shows a self shielding and we particularly plot the dust optical depth as a function of the uh, broadband hydrogen column density. And uh, we calculate the dust green column uh, using this uh, formula, which includes the dust self shielding effect. And this shows the dust optical depth can be explained by the variation of dust green columns among different lines of sight. So we identified at least three different dust, col dust green column regions. So the here we assumed the dust size is about 0.3 micrometer. Actually, if we change a different size, that still doesn't uh, change uh, the results. So the dust size doesn't matter. So later we uh, compare our uh, optical depths with the molecular hydrogen in the radio. On the left, the figure shows the latest uh, 21 centimeter radio survey for the carbon oxygen dark uh, H2 cases for 10 kilometer per second dispersion. The sources in our survey is uh, showing, this shows the location of the sources. On the right, we have we'll plot the silicon gas optical depth in red and the silicon dust optical depth in blue as a function of the molecular hydrogen in radio. Uh, we say the silicon gas optical depths are st uh, still co linearly correlating with uh, uh, molecular hydrogen, but for the dust, it roughly correlates with uh, molecular hydrogen. So this curve uh, can be uh, expressed in this formula. Uh, for this part, uh, we have measured uh, gas and the uh, dust optical depth and the uh, silicon K towards different lines of sight. We found the uh, gas optical depths uh, grow fairly consistent with uh, hydrogen column density and the uh, dust uh, optical depths are a lot homogeneous. And our dust optical depths uh, are consistent with the standard dust size distribution. And when we compare with the radio survey uh, and the lower uh, molecular hydrogen, the dust optical depths are also lower uh, in direction of higher amounts of uh, molecular hydrogen, the dust optical, uh, optical depths are also higher. So we have talked about these two parts and the next we would like to study the pulsars near the galactic center with the multi-mission observations. Uh, so this can be used to test the GR as well as tracing the dark matter profile. So we would like to uh, use the Fermi Gamma Space Telescope as well as uh, a 500 meter aperture spheric telescope uh, uh, fast uh, in China. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> Click the wrong place. Sorry for the technical. Impasse. Yeah, stop sharing. Just stop sharing. Is it? I'm mute. Okay, it's unmute. Okay. Thank you so much, June, for the wonderful presentation. So, do we have any? Do we have any question from the audience in person? Don't see any. Uh, anybody online? Zoom people. 
Any comment, question, feedback? I don't know what is the mouse. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if the 12 minute period you found in the reduced burn data for that one slide. So are you going to bring that as a spin period or a local period? Or you know what it, is there a model for where it comes from? Oh, uh, yeah. So that one, uh, you mean for the uh, Arch Luminous Exos M30 X8? Right. Yeah. So we uh, uh, confirm it's uh, from the Source M series A X eight, so we it's likely to be a, a arch luminous X person candidate. So, um, but we still need more data to confirm that. Yeah, because uh, so it such would be a new chunk sort of spinning every twelve minutes. Uh, yeah. So because um, if if it is confirmed as an arch luminous X person, it will be the slowest uh, UX person so far. So, which means it has a very high magnetic field um, um, to, to sustain such uh, high luminosity and such a long spin period, uh, but we are still in the process to confirm it. Also, we need to get uh, more data to confirm it. Yeah. So, because currently there are only uh, nine r luminous x parcel. If this one is confirmed, there will be an uh, exciting result. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Any more question? Anybody? No? Okay, so let's thank our speakers again. Uh, let me remind you that uh, we still have plenty of room for one-on-one uh, -on -one appointments. Barbara will uh, meet under specific request. She didn't uh, have a specific time for spreadsheet. Uh, uh, another uh, reminder, next week, we'll, we're not having the usual uh, seminar, but we'll have uh, the Southampton student presentations. So you are very welcome to attend those as well. Um, thank you so much, and I will see you next week. <laughs>